The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15570 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on changes to pension credit could cost mixed-age couples £7,320 annually. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and can ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Kenneth Gibson to open the debate. Mr Gibson, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I first wish to thank Age Scotland and Engender for their very helpful briefings. When I submitted today's motion back in January, I held on to some hope that the UK Tory government would reconsider its callous decision to force newly retired people whose partners are younger than the state retirement age of 65 to claim universal credit rather than pension credit. Unfortunately, with this change coming to force next Wednesday, 15th of May, it seems that the Tories are choosing to ignore calls from Age Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland, Engender, MSPs, MPs and campaigners who have expressed concerns about the impact this change will have on some of Scotland's poorest pensioners. If this is no minor change, the switch to universal credit could cost affected households £140.44 a week or £7,320 a year. Put, an, put another way, the pension credit guarantee tops up a couple's income to a minimum of £12,940 a year. Under universal credit, the standard allowance entitles couples to less than half of that. Such a cut could devastate a couple's finances and ultimately their overall health and well-being. As Age Scotland said, when the announcement was sneaked out on the day of the first meaningful vote on Brexit, such an outrageous new policy will do nothing but penalise older couples of mixed age, making them poorer for living together. As if being forced onto universal credit, the problems of which are well documented, wasn't bad enough. The loss of pension credit will have a profound impact on other aspects of social security delivery as a passporting benefit. If eligible for pension benefit credit, one will receive free NHS dental treatment called weather payments, help with housing benefit and council tax. The loss of such support can only impoverish our poorest pensioners. To illustrate this, I offer the example of a mixed-age couple renting a one-bedroom property in North Ayrshire in council tax band C with a monthly rent of £373 and receiving a state pension of £160 a week in pension credit. Their total loss after being moved to universal credit would be £9,223.80 a year, an enormous sum. Indeed, the Scottish Government estimate that by 2021, 3,800 mixed-age households in Scotland alone will collectively lose around £20.8 million. It's shocking that the UK Tory Government has not considered that this change may force couples who find themselves financially pressured into splitting up. While it argues that pension credit was not designed for working-age claimants, universal credit was never designed for pensioners, as it includes no additional support for a couple where one member is not expected to work because they are over state pension age. Justification for the policy is therefore deeply flawed. Even more gallingly, as touched on earlier, these changes were sneaked out in a written statement by Parliamentary Secretary for Pensions and Financial Inclusion, Guy Opperman MP, on the evening of 14th of January 2019, when the Prime Minister suffered a crushing defeat at Westminster as MPs rejected their Brexit deal. This drama allowed pension credit changes to be buried deep in the news agenda, even though it will drive many older people and their partners in Scotland and across the UK into poverty. Age Scotland responded quickly to the statement and is working hard to help as many eligible people as possible claim pension credit before the 15th of May changeover. Tories might try to cover their backs by stating that this change was legislated for in 2012 and it's too late to turn the tide. Age Scotland, however, told the Social Security Committee that the Welfare Reform Act was 182 pages long with provisions on mixed-age couples buried among the introduction of universal credit and personal independence payments. However, these changes can still be stopped. The UK government presented these reforms as gender neutral because universal credit treats women and men in the same circumstances equally. However, Engender understood that pension credit changes will compound the situation already faced by women affected by the increase in the state pension qualifying age. Changes to pension credit entitlement, which may otherwise have offered a lifeline for women against state pension inequality, will hit this group of WASPI women especially hard. In addition, women are more likely to be the younger person in a couple having to work or claim working age benefits despite the likelihood that they already have unpaid caring duties. It seems the UK Tory government cares little about the impact this policy will have. In announcing the change, the UK government must have known how many people will be affected in each UK nation. Such information is crucial for devolved governments and the third sector in order to adequately prepare their services. In spite of this, the UK government has still not provided a comprehensive geographic breakdown. 
Of course, with Michelle Ballantyne as their welfare spokesperson, it's little surprise that Tory MSPs are not challenging their Westminster counterparts to reverse or delay this change. When asked at the Social Security Committee only two weeks ago today if she would sign a letter from the committee asking for a six-month extension to the 15th of May and 13th of August deadlines to allow both the Scottish and UK governments to do all they can to maximise benefit uptake, she replied, and I quote, Do I care one way or the other? I probably do not, actually, if I'm honest. That perfectly encapsulates the indifference Tories have towards the real suffering their policies inflict. These same Tories propose to take free TV licence away from over 75s, deny women born in the 1950s their full right to state pensions and are pushing thousands of pensioners into poverty when the UK already has one of the lowest earnings to pensions ratios in Europe. It is imperative fairness at the heart of our pension system and the older people are treated with dignity. The risks are not just financial. People on lower incomes are also susceptible to poorer health. Reducing the incomes of some older people will force them to choose between heating and eating. It is undeniable that those who cannot afford to heat their homes are more likely to suffer from poor health, placing more stress on our NHS. The Scottish Government and our local authorities will be left to pick up the pieces of this disastrous short-sighted policy. It is unrealistic to expect the Scottish Government to mitigate the impact of this cut. To do so for each Tory welfare reform would be impossible. By 2020-21, it is estimated that mitigating UK welfare cuts would cost £3.7 billion, three times the Police Scotland budget. Meanwhile, 100% of national insurance contributions raised in Scotland flow to the Treasury. Presiding officer, I encourage any older person listening today who is concerned about their income to call Age Scotland's excellent helpline. It is free and available from Monday to Friday from 9am to 5pm on 0800 1244 2. I'll repeat that number. 0800 1244 2. It offers free benefit checks and can support older people with pension credit claims. It is vital that older people claim the support to which they are entitled. Any situation where an older person would be financially better off living alone claiming pension credit than living as a couple claiming universal credit is unacceptable. The UK Tory government must act to prevent this and must act now. Thank you very much. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I actually thank Mr Gibson for bringing this debate to the Chamber, because hopefully it will ensure that anyone who is entitled to pension credit is made aware of the changes, and if they want to, ensure they apply for before the deadline. Uh, Mr Gibson is right on a couple of things. Certainly it was part of the 2012 Welfare Reform Bill. Um, and the decision was made back then. It was actually debated then, and there were a number of discussions around it. But the actual reminding of bringing out the date of change did come out on the date he said. And I think that was a concern to everybody. However, it is important to note that while the change to entitlement does take place next week, applicants have until the 13th of August 2019 to register a backdated claim if they were eligible next week. And that, that gap is really important in terms of making sure as many people as possible do actually get what they're entitled to at the moment. Eligibility for benefits is probably one of the most contentious subjects. And whatever the decisions of governments, there will always be individuals and organisations who will argue that a decision is not fair. It is therefore the role of government to try and find a balance that is consistent in its application and transparent to the people. Now, pensions are particularly complicated. And we have a situation currently where people who have not reached state pension age can claim pension age benefits. Pension credit is designed to help our most vulnerable elderly, those who have not built up a pension and have no other recourse to funds after retirement age. It is rightly designed to ensure a minimum level of income, and I have no doubt that everyone in the, this chamber supports it. However, when Mr Gibson and others talk of a loss of income of 7,320 7, for mixed age couples, that will rightly cause alarm, and it should. However, it should also be made clear that this change is not retrospective. So any mixed age couple currently in receipt of pension credit or who successfully apply before the deadline will not lose this benefit unless their circumstances change. The question that arises when faced with a mixed age couple is one of whether a working age adult should be exempt from the same obligations that their peers incur by dint of a partnership with a pensionable individual. As pension credit has a 100% withdrawal rate for earnings over a small threshold of around £10 per week for most couples, there is in fact a positive disincentive for a younger partner to work. 
The difference that Mr Gibson is quoting assumes a comparison of a couple who have no income beyond their welfare entitlements. However, as universal credit has a 63% withdrawal rate over a much larger work allowance for a couple, it stands at around £503. The reality is any pension that the older partner has or any income that is earned by the younger partner means that that gap will in fact be smaller. However, one area of real concern to me is the entitlement to passported benefits. And that is an area I think we should look closely at because of the potential impact of that change. And particularly so because the number of the relevant benefits are actually being devolved to this parliament. And the Scottish Government will be able to make decisions about the criterion entitlement. Around two-thirds of those eligible for pension care credit currently do not claim. And I don't want anyone who is struggling to miss out on what they are due. So I hope that this discussion does in fact raise awareness. Interestingly, on the point of Mr Gibson's comments about what I said in committee, um, I can't remember off the top of my head where it was in private, but if it was, I shall certainly be bringing that back to chamber to discuss. But however, however, my comment... Do you want to hear what I've got to say? However, my comment was around whether we sent uh, a letter it, it, or not. It better be a point of order. If it's a debating point, it's not a point of order. I warn you, Ms White, go ahead. OK, thank, thank you very much, President Officer. The point of order, Ms Ballantyne said it was in private. It wasn't. It's all, it's all over I, the newspapers. I, I it's all heard... Over the newspapers. It wasn't in excuse private. Excuse me, Ms White, please sit down. I heard what was said. That's not actually what Ms Ballantyne said, if. But I... And I won't take comments from the front bench here either. But that's a matter that can be raised by others in debate if they wish or afterwards. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Balting. No, I was merely going to say that that comment was made in reference as to whether we sent a letter at that time. And it was backed up by saying, if I remember correctly, that I felt we were probably too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Gillian Martin, who will be followed by Elaine Smith. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. As Ruth Davidson returned to frontline politics at the weekend, she said in her conference speech, a secure pension age has gone. Well, too true. Pension security in the UK has gone. And the Tories are set to make life even harder for pensioners. And I thank Kenneth Gibson for securing this debate to allow this to be discussed. Because changes to pension credit will cost the poorest in Scotland up to £7,000 a year, a large chunk of money for anyone to, to lose, but the difference between eating and heating for their poorest pensioners. The fact is the UK state pension is already the worst in the developed world. This is according to data from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. As a percentage of earnings, the UK government pays out only 29%, putting it at the bottom of the table, and this is in comparison to other EU nations like the Netherlands, which pays out 100%, and Portugal, which offers 94%, or Italy, which gives 93.2%. Before the independence referendum in 2014, Labour's Gordon Brown warned that Scotland leaving the UK would come with, and I quote, a pensions time bomb. The Tory government backed that claim. But as we now know, they went on to increase the pension age for women without notice, meaning that some will lose up to £30,000. Now that's a pensions time bomb. And I stand with the waspy women in their condemnation of the Tory UK government who have let them down. <clears throat> and it's low earners and women that are bearing the biggest cost of pension reforms. The numbers of pension age people having to use food banks is a national disgrace. And of course, the announcement of these changes was revealed, this latest ten pensions time bomb was revealed by the Tory government on the eve of Prime Minister Theresa May's humiliating Brexit deal defeat in January. Slipped under the radar, and with no debate or vote in the House of Commons, this cut has been made as part of the Welfare Reform Act, and the pensioners of the UK, present and future, have been scammed. And this is simply more bad news for women born in the 1950s who've been affected by the increase in state pension age already. No, I won't take an intervention. There are hundreds of women in the northeast of Scotland and in my constituency of Aberdeenshire East who've been affected by the increase of pension age and I have met with them repeatedly and I stand with them in their condemnation. 
And this policy could impact them even further when they're already struggling under the weight of changes made. My party does not support the unfair manner in which these changes were made. And we have repeatedly asked for the UK government to give those women their money. More than 2 million women have been affected by the changes already made and now changes to pension aid will cause even more financial uncertainty for them. People who claim a disability benefit too will also be heavily impacted. And more than 50% of those who re receive pension credits also claim a disability benefit. In 2018, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's UK Poverty Report highlighted that previous falls in pensioner poverty was in part due to the introduction of pension credits. And Labour are not off the hook here either. They campaigned with the Tories in 2013 and 14 to frighten pensioners into thinking they'd lose their pensions in independent Scotland. Well, it's time we took control of the pensions for their Scottish older people and give them the retirement they deserve. The UK is not working for Scotland's pensioners. Thank you very much. I call Lade Smith, who will be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. And can I also thank Kenneth Gibson for securing the debate today on an issue which will affect thousands of pensioners and couples across the country. The motion before us condemns the Tory government's decision to make this change, and I most certainly support that. It's a particularly harmful change in the way pensioners and mixed-age couples receive income, and it will undoubtedly result in hardship, pushing people further into poverty and affecting health and well-being. So while this detrimental change um, is part of the Tories' failed austerity policies, which have caused misery for families up and down the UK, it is disappointing that the Scottish Government have not done more to raise awareness of the change. Um, however, of course, Kenneth Gibson's debate today and motion should help to do that, since we're imminently looking at the change happening. And of course, a further issue that's been mentioned is that of the high number of people who are eligible but not claiming due to lack of awareness. As I mentioned last week in a question in this chamber, Age Scotland have cited figures from the DWP which estimate that up to 40% of couples who are entitled to receive pension credit are not receiving it. And although couples currently receiving pension credits will not be immediately affected by the upcoming changes, they could be affected if their circumstances change at any point in the future. And that is a massively important point that has to be made in this debate today. Of course, the policy is the latest in the long line of Tory government reforms that, as usual, will have a greater impact on the most vulnerable in society. Again, Age Scotland tells us 38% of people over the age of 50 are financially squeezed, while 4 in 10 pensioner couples struggle to pay their bills. And pensioner credit is a vital tool in helping people who are in pensioner poverty, which affects an estimated 170,000 people in Scotland. The benefit change will also have a greater effect on women, there is no doubt about that, and those are women who have already suffered by an increased state pension age, as mentioned by Gillian Martin. They were not adequately warned of that and they were not given time to make alternative arrangements for retirement. These new pension credit rules will have a further harsh impact on these women. And as Kenneth Gibson himself mentioned in his opening speech, the UK government has presented their welfare reforms as gender neutral, but for women and men who apply for universal credit, their actual circumstances are rarely the same and often very different. This is due to societal persistence of underlying traditional gender norms, with many women spending longer out of work at home in caring roles. State and private pension levels are more unfavourable to women due to this. Part-time work, the gender pay gap, historic maternity and gender discrimination at work also means that contributions have been lower and perhaps no national insurance contributions made. Women who have had long or multiple breaks in employment are often more reliant on state pension as their core income. Clearly this change um, has certainly not been poverty proofed, but neither has it been subject to a gender impact assessment. President officer, the impact of this policy doesn't even just end with the people directly affected, because it's also going to have unintended consequences on local economies. If new applicant couples are in receipt of over £7,000 less per year, then that is definitely going to impact on local economies. And as we know, our high streets have long been declining as more people shop online and jobs are being lost. And pensioners, of course, are still the least likely people to be buying online. So even if the Tories are not interested in personal hardship, then I would have actually thought the impact on local business might cause them some concern. In conclusion, the UK government really must think again about this harmful policy change. 
But if they are not going to do that, and it doesn't look like they are, then the Scottish Government need to do their best to highlight the fact that it is happening imminently. It will undoubtedly have a massive impact on pensioner poverty in this country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Smith. I call Alison Johnson, who will be followed by Alistair Allen. Ms Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Kenny Gibson for bringing this very important issue to the Chamber for debate today. It seems that just when we get our heads around one change in its impact, along comes another, often affecting the very same people. The changes to pension credit outlined in the motion this afternoon are yet another, which will have a hugely negative impact on the incomes of households affected. 3,800 households in Scotland could be as much as £7,000 a year worse off claiming after the 15th of May as compared to claiming before. With so many cuts and changes coming down the line, it is all the more important that people are well informed. Yet, as we've heard, this hasn't happened. The new mixed-aged couple rules were legislated for as long ago as 2012, as has been mentioned, but they were only announced in January, just four months before the policy comes into force, in the lowest profile way possible, a written statement. There are clear parallels with the women's state pension age change here. That was similarly legislated for ahead of time, but not cl clearly notified to people. And as a consequence, WASPy women are retiring much later than they thought they would with their plans for retirement in tatters. It's shocking that the lesson highlighted by the tireless campaigning of the WASPy women hasn't yet been learned by the UK government. And all that is made even worse by the fact that pension credit already has an insufficient take-up rate with 40% of those eligible for it not claiming. So that means that many couples are eligible to claim under the current system, but in less than a week will have to claim under the new system and may lose thousands of pounds as a result. There simply hasn't been enough time for organisations which support older people to raise awareness. Uh, the DWP's justification for this is that pension credit wasn't designed for people of working age and that the change will mean, and I'm quoting, the same work incentives apply to apply to the younger partner as apply to other people of the same age. But while pension credit may not have been intended for people of working age, it's equally true that universal credit wasn't intended to be claimed by pensioners. It includes no additional support for a couple where one member isn't expected to work because they're over the state pension age. And as the state pension age rises, they will be in that unfair situation for longer. And note that phrase, work incentives. That is very telling. This is really about making the younger partner subject to benefit sanctions. Yet we have overwhelming evidence to suggest that benefit conditionality and sanctions don't work. A study by Glasgow and Heriot Watt universities found that the threat or experience of a benefit sanction is routinely ineffective in facilitating people's entry into or progression within the paid labour market over time. As well, of course, as causing huge stress and worry in the process. And so, in the name of extending the reach of benefit sanctions yet further, the UK government is making almost 4,000 households worse off. That is shameful. It is no surprise that Age Scotland refer to this as an outrageous new policy and say that it will have a devastating impact on Scotland's poorest pensioners, and they are urging the government to reverse it. In closing, presiding officer, I too would like to draw attention to the gendered impact as highlighted by Engender and others in the chamber. There's yet another change to social security entitlements that hit women harder than men. In this case, women are more likely to be the younger partner and subject to conditionality. And for women impacted by poorly notified increases to the state pension age, changes to their pension credit entitlement, which may otherwise have offered them a lifeline in the absence of their pension, will be hit especially hard. To close, Greens are dismayed by yet another hole being put in our already severely frayed social security safety net, one which was announced in the quietest way possible, meaning that couples who might have been able to exempt themselves will no longer be able to. And all that to extend a thoroughly discredited system of sanctions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alistair Allen, who will be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Allen, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin, firstly, by thanking Kenneth Gibson for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber today. As we've heard from uh, Wednesday, newly retired pensioners will be barred from claiming uh, pension credit if they have a younger partner and will instead be forced onto universal credit. 
Now, there are estimates that the impact of these changes uh, on the average claimant will, as we've heard, be in the, will be in the region of between £5,000 and £6,000 per year. And the financial consequences could be even more far-reaching than that. Pension credit, uh, as members will know, is a passporting benefit, meaning that mixed-age couples could lose out on other forms of assistance. This includes cold weather payments, housing benefit, council tax reductions, social fund funeral payments, and possibly their entitlement to the warm home discount. Now, as if this policy wasn't bad enough, the means by which it was delivered do, uh, in my view, add considerable insult to injury. As Mr Gibson mentioned, uh, by sneaking this uh, amendment out by means of a, a written statement from a DWP minister on the same day as the first meaningful, if I may use that last word rather broadly, vote in the House of Commons uh, on Brexit, the, the UK government clearly wanted this to go as unnoticed as possible and avoid scrutiny over a decision that they knew very well would be unpopular. I would like to pay tribute to Age Scotland for their efforts in highlighting these changes. It's certainly worth considering, I believe, a hypothetical example provided by Age Scotland to illustrate what this could mean for a typical household in this situation. Peter, uh, they give us a, as a hypothetical example, aged 70, draws a state pension of £140 a week. His wife, Jean, aged 62, gave up work five years ago to care for her father, who has recently died. Uh, they own their own home and have a few hundred pounds in savings. They receive pension credit to top up their joint income to £248 a week. After the rule change, Peter and Jean's position will be protected if they are still receiving pension credit when any changes come in, as long as their circumstances stay the same. However, a couple in this situation who need to claim benefits for the first time after the 15th of May 2019 would not be entitled to pension credit due to Jean's age. Peter's state pension is too high for them to receive universal credit, so their joint income will just be Peter's state pension. If Jean cannot find a job, which may be difficult given her age and her time out of the labour market for caring, this will be their income for another four years until Jean reaches SPA at age uh, 66. And by this time, Peter will be 74. However, if Peter was living on his own because uh, they separate or Jean dies, he would be able to claim pension credit, in which case his state pension will be topped up to £163 a week, considerably more than the universal credit standard for a, a couple of about £115 a week. Presiding officer, um, it's very clear from those and many other examples that, uh, that uh, changes to pension credit are going to have a significant impact on mixed age pensioner households when they come into force next week. For the UK government to penalise people simply for having a younger partner is completely unacceptable. This is a benefit designed for some of our poorest pensioners and they should not be forced to pay for the price uh, of the Tories' ideologically driven cuts to welfare. The UK government and its supporters cannot continue to brush aside the deep and damaging failings of their social security system. Now, Mr Gibson uh, has already uh, mentioned that only a few weeks ago uh, in committee when the Tories social security spokesperson was asked if she would support a cross-party letter to the UK government calling for a delay to these changes, uh, she replied, do I care one way or the other? I probably do not, actually, if I'm honest. Presenting officer, I, I hate to break this to the member, uh, that was not in private session. Uh, I'm quoting the official report because it was uh, a discussion uh, on the public record. But the more important point is, presiding officer, that the indifference of the governing party in the UK continues to push families into poverty and to force people to turn to food banks in order to get by. I hope that this parliament, by contrast, does not share the Tories' indifference about this matter. It's time now for the Tories to reverse this attack on low-income pensioner households. Thank you. Uh, can I say before I call the next member, if just sit down just a moment, Mr Balfour. In view of the number of members remaining to speak in today's debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I would ask Kenneth Gibson to move such a motion. Uh, moved, presiding officer. Are members in agreement? 
Thank you very much. No members having disagreed, I therefore extend this debate understanding order rule 8.14.3 and I now call on Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I think it's important to start with what pension credit was designed to do. It was designed to provide long-term support for pensioner households who are no longer economically active. That being the key word, economically active. It was never designed to support work age claimants. And I think that that change is simply wrong to talk about. The Scottish Conservatives want to make work pay and encourage people to be in work. And this change means that the same work incentives will apply to the younger partner as well as to other people of the same age and ensures that taxpayer support is directed where it is most needed and help those in society that need it. I think uh, we have to be careful, and I'm sure Julian Martin wasn't saying this, but it was perhaps implied that this is not a retrospective change. Anyone who is in uh, receipt of this benefit now, it will not change. If you're currently a mixed age pensioner couple, pension credit will not stop. It is new claimants that are affected or as we've heard, if your circumstances change. So I think, again, we have to be careful with the language that we use within the Chamber this afternoon. Lane Smith. Well, I thank the member for taking the intervention, but I wonder if he has a view on whether or not this outrageous policy might be subject to legal challenge under sex discrimination, and, in fact, does it undermine the right to family life under the Human Rights Act? Mr Balfour. Uh, well, as someone who's not practised law, uh, law for over 30 years, uh, I think I will uh, avoid getting into uh, legal debate. Where I think there could be consensus on this issue this afternoon is in regard to the take-up. Um, as Alison, Alison Johnson has already pointed out, Deputy President Officer, there is um, at least 40% of people who could be claiming this at the moment who are not. And that is disappointing. I also do agree that the way that this policy was uh, announced was perhaps disappointing and there has been a lack of advertising of what is going to happen um, by uh, the UK government. However, as Michelle Ballantyne has pointed out, um, you can apply up to August this year and it will be looked at. And I do wonder whether the Scottish government um, would commit um, to doing some more advertising office over the next few months. Um, in their response to the committee, uh, they did point out that some work was being done by Age Scotland, but no work has been done by Scottish Government. And I would also make the same plea to the UK Government as well, that over these remaining uh, weeks um, and months that are still available, that more is uh, done to advertise and so that the take-up is being properly known. I do think there is an, in an interesting issue as well in regard to why take-up is comparatively so low. And again, as we roll out new benefits here in Scotland, we do have to look at how will take-up happen and why are people not taking up uh, the benefits that they are entitled to. I think, in conclusion, Deputy Pres President Officer, we just have to be careful sometimes with the language that we use so we do not put fear into people who are on this benefit already. And we also have to work very carefully to make sure that take up on this benefit or on other benefits is fully maximised so that people get what they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Balfour. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Doris will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms McNeill. Presiding officer, I want to thank Kenny Gibson for a very well-written motion, an excellent speech, and for bringing this to the Chamber. And I hope it gives an opportunity for there to be full consensus and cross-party support on what Kenneth Gibson is trying to achieve against the Tories' policy. I would as far as to say, I have not seen a more callous welfare reform than this. I would go as far as to say I've not seen a welfare reform proposal that has so undermined family life than the one before us. I remember when the Labour government introduced pension credits, along with child tax credits, and Gordon Brown did it 
to lift thousands of pensioners and families out of poverty. And he did it in the full knowledge that there were pensioner couples, some of working age, and he did it to dr dramatically improve the living standards of those pensioners. And he achieved success in doing that. And to roll back those achievements will absolutely, as other members have said, push more pensioners into poverty because we know it's new couples or, or new claimants. But we know from experience of the tax credit system that any change in circumstance, any change, you're in that pot of people and you will lose your pension credit. I think Elaine Smith is absolutely right. The, it, the, it's the element which is so scandalous is the unfairness of mixed age couples, which this applies to. And that's an important point to concentrate on. It must be at least indirect discrimination, if not direct discrimination, because when you look at this, it is women who will bear the brunt of this, who tend to be younger. So I hope some organisations might be looking at how this can already be challenged. So, the, so we've got the 14th of May to the 13th of August to submit a claim if you haven't already done so. But I'm afraid I think there will be thousands of people who will still lose out. But we've got a job to do there in making them aware of that. Reaching pension age where you don't have an adequate pension, and this is part, part, primarily the root of the problem. There are many employers or not that are required to provide a pension these days. But some of the pensions, particularly in the private sector, are absolutely appalling and have led to low, low pay and low pensions. Um, if you're that person, you, you, uh, you retire and you have that sharp drop in income, you're actually going to be penalised in, in every way if you're part of a mixed um, couple. Because it places a much greater burden on the younger partner where they're now going to, in, in effect, play the role of the state by providing and making up for that income. There's no doubt in my mind um, that what I think is a heartbreaking policy, that those couples who have age gaps, 10, 12, 15 years and beyond, you can see the heavy burden that's going to have on the younger person and in fact the relationship. Which is why I say I haven't really seen a policy that's so undermined family life um, than the one before us. And not to mention, so you've heard from Kenny Gibson the figures, but those are real figures. They're not manufactured, they are real figures. And it isn't just the loss of the up to £7,000. We already know the hardship and trauma of people forced onto universal credit, a system that is still far uh, to be ready for, for, for its purpose. And the trauma of being locked into that, I really fear uh, for those couples, and I'm quite happy to use um, that word. Elaine Smith said that the level of impact on the local economy will be substantial if you actually look at the losses, which in the future will be significant. Never mind the impact on the housing crisis, because the losses of 28 million, I think Alistair Allen mentioned, does mean there's going to be a quite a large societal impact. Uh, I'll close the presiding, presiding officers at four minutes uh, or five. Uh, I'll just finish by saying, um, I think it's a heartbreaking policy. Many people have no control over this whatsoever because it's sprung on them at a time where they can't even plan to change the, their, their family income. I think we've got to stick together on this. I don't think it's too late to stop this. I think we've got to get out there, argue our case, and hope that something can be done. And maybe the Tories on the other side this might actually have some compassion for once in their life and decide to join us in calling for some change. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now call Bob Doris. Mr Doris, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I start off, as others have done, by thanking Kenneth Gibson, MSP, for securing this absolutely vital debate. As convener of the Social Security Committee in this parliament, I'm deeply worried about these pension credit changes will effectively cut to some low-income pensioner households. Uh, some pensioners have, in effect, simply been targeted because of the age of their partner, and that's simply not right. These concerns led to our committee holding an evidence session with Age Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland. The evidence they gave was deeply worrying. It was alarming. But of course, alarm bells should be ringing. The original policy document relating uh, to this dates back to 2011, actually. It was produced by the UK Government Minister, Chris Grayling, MP. We should not be surprised that the man who gave ferry contracts to companies without ferries designed a policy to deny pension protections to low-income pensioners. 
Adam's the cure from Age Scott, we're told our committee these cuts would have a devastating impact on the finances of the poorest pensioners. He also raised concerns over the impact on passport and benefits, as we've heard, such as cold weather payments, council tax reduction and housing benefits. So those not relying on passport and benefits will lose up to £7,000 a year, and those relying on passport and benefits potentially £10,000 a year. And this is not an abstract debate, but a looming reality for low-income low mixed-couple households. Here's an example that Adam Stakura gave our committee. He said, I was speaking to a gentleman at the meeting of older people in Glasgow last week who told me that he was 70, his wife is 60, and still working. He is the first person whom I have spoken to who's been a mixed-age couple on a very low state pension. He did not realise he might be entitled to pension credit, so he wasn't claiming it. So his first step was going to be to call their helpline. Because of the 10-year age gap between him and his wife, and the rise in the state pension age, so WASPI women affected, as previously mentioned, he realised that it could be six or seven years until they could claim pension credit after the policy change. Uh, presiding officer, that's simply appalling. Our committee agreed to urgently write to the UK Secretary of State, Amber Rudd, raising our concerns and urging these cuts to be scrapped. That was, of course, except the Tory members who did not agree to sign up to that letter. We received a reply from the UK Minister for Pensions and Financial Inclusion, Guy Opperman, MP. Now, given the policy intent that Guy Opperman, MP, is proposing, his ministerial title is laughable. But, but I suppose one aspect is accurate because he's the Minister for Pensions. He's certainly not the Minister for Pensioners because he's letting them down categorically here. Well, he unsurprisingly rejected our representations. But let me tell you a couple of things he did say, presenting officer, in his reply to myself as convener. He said it is important to be clear that this is about making sure that all working age people, irrespective of their partner's age, are subject to the same labour market approach. What an idiotic thing to say. Fundamentally, what he is doing is discriminating against pensioner households. He's distinguishing between some low-income pensioner households in poverty and against other ones. So he's absolutely wrong-headed in relation to discriminating against people simply because they love, love with someone who is younger than them. He also said, presiding officer, mixed age, pensioners and mixed age couples claiming universal credit will not be subject to any work-related conditionality rules. However, conditionality for working age partners will be tailored to meet their specific circumstances, just as it would be for any other claimant. So there you have it, presiding officer. Not only will some households be £7,000 worse off, they'll be subject to sanction under universal credit, a double whammy and simply un acceptable. On the 29th of April, uh, our committee wrote back to Guy Opperman asking for a six-month delay, given that 40% of households uh, do not claim the pension credit they're entitled to. I have to say that Michelle Ballantyne and Jeremy Balfour signed up to that letter. I was disappointed they didn't sign up to rejecting the policy intent, but they did sign up to delay. Uh, but it's only six days now to this, kick, this kicks in. We've had no reply. This is going to happen unless there's a U-turn by the UK government. But, presiding officer, I think the final thing to say, other than showing solidarity, uh, yes? Michelle Ballantyne. Mr Doris, as the convener, would you agree that when I said to you that I didn't, I wasn't, it didn't care either way when we sent the letter, it was because I felt it was too late, and you're now saying exactly that, that we haven't had a response yet, but I was quite happy to sign up to the letter on the basis that I felt, thought there were things that needed to be looked at. Bob well, Doris. Well, well, my interpretation, first of all, is that uh, Michelle Ballantyne agrees with these changes, which I find appalling, quite frankly. You're defending these changes, but I was pleased you signed up to a letter, even though you were completely indifferent about signing up to that letter. But you did sign up to it uh, to fair play. But ultimately, we are tinkering at the edges, uh, edges of trying to uh, defend uh, the income of uh, impoverished pensioners in our country. There's got to be a better way of doing this. By God, can we get power over pensions and benefits to this parliament? Because no way we redo, no way we retreat pensioners as appallingly as the Tory government does. Thank you very much. I now recall Shirley Ann Somerville to close for the government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to begin by thanking Kenneth Gibson for bringing this important matter to the Chamber today and for the contributions of everyone that has taken part. The impact of the UK government's decision to change entitlement to pension credit will, like so many other of their decisions, impact on the poorest in our society and indeed the most vulnerable. Indeed, in this case, they are paying the price simply for having a younger partner. 
This change, which, as we have heard, could see a drastic impact on a couple's finances, is just another example of the UK government making it more difficult for people to get the support that they need. We could spend hours talking about the problems with universal credit, and indeed we have done so, presiding officer, on many occasions in this chamber. This change in particular will force even more people onto a system that simply isn't fit for purpose. The issues with universal credit, such as the five-week minimum wait for a first payment and the difficulties many people have even receiving the correct payment are bad enough. But for anyone in a couple where one person is under and one over the state pension age, the level of support they are now entitled to will be even lower. Simply put, the UK government has made the decision to give these couples less money to live on. And as Alison Johnson and others have quite rightly pointed out, they are opening more people up to the discredited sanction regime. That's not to mention the fact that this decision was announced and the commencement of this policy was announced quietly, as many have pointed out through a written ministerial statement on the day of the meaningful vote on the 14th of January, just four months before the policy came into effect. At that time, Age UK accused the UK government of attempting to bury bad news, and I couldn't agree more. Whilst it can be argued that it is fairer for a person of working age to be subject to the same benefit as everyone else in that position, the loss of pension credit for those on pension age partners is extremely unfair and completely unjust, as is the sanction regimes and many other aspects of universal credit that underpins the benefit system. As Kenneth Gibson, Alison Johnson have pointed out, universal credit is not designed for those of a pension age. I wrote to the UK government earlier this year and asked to see the impact assessment that had been carried out on this policy. In his response, Guy Opperman, the UK government's minister for pensions, told me that there was no impact assessment, only that the DWP had published some ad hoc statistics. All these statistics showed where the numbers affected and the money to be saved, nothing about the impact on people's lives. Mr Opperman also wrote to the chair of the Working Pensions Committee to say that as the UK government makes no forecast of poverty rates, an assessment of the impact of the mixed age couples changes on poverty has therefore not been made. One of the aspects which it is very important and I'm very pleased that many of the contributors today have highlighted is the impact that this policy change will have particularly on women. Kenneth Gibson, Gillian Martin, Elaine Smith, Alison Johnson, many others uh, brought this up. And the engender briefing for this debate was quite right to point out that this compounds the issues that are affecting the WASPy women. Now, not long ago, presiding officer, we were in this chamber uh, to debate the WASPy campaign and the fight of the WASPy women. The debate highlighted once again that the UK government is denying the full state pensions to those women. And as I said during that debate, and I will repeat today, it is not the UK government's money, it is the WASPy women's money, and they are absolutely entitled to that. And this is yet another unfortunate example, however, with the pension credit changes of a welfare, welfare cut that's hitting women hardest. Elaine Smith also quite rightly pointed out to the fact that this isn't just about that personal hardship, difficult though that will be. It's about the health and well-being. It's about the social isolation that will be created with this pension change and also about the important community impacts that this will have as well. This goes much wider uh, than simply the pension uh, credit couples that we're talking about. It has a much wider impact as many changes to the welfare system it does. Alistair Allen and others also pointed out that this change it has a direct impact on the passported benefits that many people will be entitled to. And for those that are relying on passported benefits, it, the cut from this pension credit change will be even more severe. This again goes to show that this has many different aspects that will be affecting many different people in different ways. The other important aspect which has been drawn out by many members is that the fact that those on pension credit at the moment um, are not safe um, as they continue. If there's one change of circumstance and they, um, they tell the DWP about that, they will also lose out. That puts those that are on pension credit at the moment in fear of losing their entitlements um, in the future. 
Can I return to one aspect which uh, Michelle Ballantyne and Jeremy Belfer and, uh, and others pointed out about encouraging people to sign up for pension credit? Um, I couldn't agree more. What a shame that the UK government has never taken that seriously. When Jeremy Balfour, when Jeremy Balfour talks yes, to the have. fact, I'll, I'll get on to that. Yeah, you just absolutely. give me a minute, Mr Balfour, and I'll get on to what the Scottish government is doing to pick up the pieces where the UK government has failed. Because the UK government does not encourage take-up of benefits, as we are committed to do under the so Scottish social security system. Where is the UK government uptake campaign to be able to support uh, those uh, that will be affected by this? Let's not rely, with the greatest respect to the, the, the audience that's listening today and online, to our members' debate in the Scottish Parliament to encourage uptake. Where's the UK government's uptake campaign to be able to encourage uh, uptake for a, a pension credit that has one of the, the lowest rates? But I'll come on very specifically to what the UK government action has been on this. My predecessor, Jean Freeman, back in 2017, announced a campaign to raise awareness for those uh, with uh, pension credit um, applications that they're not taken forward because they were unaware of it. There was radio ads, there was press ads, there was a concerted effort at that point. And we're also taking action to maximise the incomes of older people and those set to retire at the moment, particularly those that will be affected by this UK government policy. That's why we're supporting older people through our financial health check service, offering free personal advice, personalised advice on money matters to help people maximise their incomes to reduce the poverty premium where they pay more for basic goods and services. The advice provides ranges from benefit uptake and council tax reduction to reducing utility bills and other household costs. Once again, the Scottish Government delivering for Scottish pensioners where they have been failed by the UK Government. But once again, a stark example of how the UK benefit system is not fit for purpose and I hear calls from those who don't want the powers to be delivered to this parliament for this parliament to actually in this government to pick up the pieces of a failed UK system. In closing, presiding officer, I am in full support of Mr Gibson and the motion today and would join once again in calling the UK government to reconsider the changes to pension credit. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of parliament till 2.30.